In our study of the Gospel of John on Sunday mornings, we've been uh, approaching this this prayer that we've now arrived at, this uh, great high priestly prayer that is the, the substance of John 17. But after Jesus enters the Garden of Gethsemane, there's another prayer. It's not even mentioned in John, but it's an important companion piece to his great high priestly prayer. It's the garden prayer of our Savior, and we'll look at it today on Beyond the Notes. It's important, or noteworthy at least, to notice that these, these really are two separate prayers. There's a, there's a clear sort of mile marker, though, though the, the garden prayer is dealt with in all of the synoptic gospels. We'll be looking at the Matthew version today. It's in Matthew and Mark and Luke. It is not mentioned at all in John, and the great high priestly prayer in John 17 is not mentioned in the other three gospels. What gives us the, the clear divider is the actual entry into the Garden of Gethsemane, which happens after John 17's priestly prayer, but before the, uh, the prayer that I've called the Garden Prayer or the prayer in Gethsemane. The Matthew account in Matthew 26 looks a lot like the Mark account, which is in Mark 14, and the Luke account, which is in Luke 22, the same details are in all three accounts. Luke does add, and we won't chase this rabbit far today, but Luke adds the detail that as Jesus prays this prayer, he is actually ministered to by an angel that comes there to attend to him in this prayer, which is prayed in the, in the, it's, it's, it's the last event before the arrest, which is going to lead into the overnight trials and ultimately the crucifixion of Jesus. Jesus is in the garden of Gethsemane. It's in Matthew 26, uh, verses 36 and, and following that I'll be looking at today. Jesus went with them to a place called Gethsemane, and we've talked about this garden, this olive grove on the side of the Mount of Olives across from the, the Kidron Brook Valley from the, the city of Jerusalem off to the, off to the east. This valley is uh, a westward walk out of the city of Jerusalem. Gethsemane literally means oil press, and so apparently this garden was one of the places where the sort of the, the olive uh, harvesting co-op there of the various olive groves on the side of the Mount of Olives would, would come to this particular grove where there was a large literal olive press where the, the uh, olives were pressed for the olive oil, which has been a huge part of, of Middle Eastern and Mediterranean cooking for, well, essentially forever. So they came to the place called Gethsemane, the oil press, and he said to his disciples, sit here while I go over there and pray, and taking with him Peter and the two sons of Zebedee, that's James and John, he began to be sorrowful and troubled. And then he said to them, My soul is very sorrowful, even the death. Remain here and watch with me. And going a little further, he fell onto his face and prayed, saying, My father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. And we'll come back and talk about what that means in a minute. And he came to the disciples and found them sleeping. Remember, this is at or after, anyways, it's, it's, it's literally in the middle of the night now after Thursday comes into Friday. And he said to Peter, so could you not watch with me one hour? Watch and pray that you may not enter into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. Again, for the second time, he went away and prayed, my father, if this cannot pass unless I drink it, your will be done. And again he came and found them sleeping, for their eyes were heavy. So leaving them again, he went away and prayed for the third time, saying the same words again. Then he came to the disciples and said to them, Sleep, and take your rest Rest later on. See, the hour is at hand, and the Son of Man is betrayed into the hands of sinners. Rise, let us be going. See, my betrayer is at hand. And at that moment, Judas and the, uh, the temple police come to effect the arrest of Jesus. This, this garden prayer has, has some great sort of cosmic themes. The, uh, the, the highest and most significant thing we, we must note as we look at this prayer is Jesus is not uh, mostly fearful of the physical agony of the, res, of the crucifixion, as terrible as that would have been. The most terrible thing that Jesus endured on the cross was not the physical torture of the cross, 
but the separation from his father for the first time in all of literal eternity to that point, there will be a conscious separation as he bears the wrath of the father, I believe, in the, in the three hours of darkness between noon and three. Jesus is literally bearing the infinite wrath of the father as God the father spares not his own son, but delivers him up for us all, according to Romans 8. That's the cup, the cup of the father's wrath. And here, Jesus is not, is not actually looking to bail on the plan that's been in place from before the foundation of the world. But the, the, the fact is that Jesus is as much God as though he were not man, but he is as much man as though he were not God. And the idea of this uh, wave of wrath that he is going to bear uh, is literally the most horrific thing any human being ever anticipated. And so here he prays in sincerity, Father, if there is another way, um, may it be. But if not, then not my will but yours. And so there is that that great cosmic theme of of sin and redemption and the the eternal plan of God. But if we were if we were to be where where we could be with these disciples, as sleepy as they were in the garden that night. And we're able to, to draw up close on the, on the, not the grand cosmic drama that's playing out, but the actual physical scene. There's some things we would see that I want to point out. First, we would see the sorrow that Jesus is bearing. He says that my soul is very sorrowful even to death. Um, now, there's a, there's a takeaway there I, I want you to get. And that is that it is, it is not sin to be burdened. Um, uh, much emphasis is put in, in a lot of circles over how important it is for the Christian to, to maintain their testimony and maintain an up and bubbly and happy countenance in, in just all settings, lest people think that you, you somehow lack joy uh, because at a given moment you're, you're not happy. That's, that's not true. There is no obligation, child of God, for you to be um, happy all the time. Uh, it's it's not a bad thing to be happy, but it's not a bad thing to be burdened either. And this proves beyond any doubt that there is there is no sin in being greatly burdened, even sorrowful. Jesus is very sorrowful in this moment, and we see that. And today you may be uh, bearing some terrific and sorrowful burdens. Um, bear them well, and honor your Lord as you bear them, but bear them honestly. And if the emotions go to a difficult place, let them go there. Don't crack yourself up trying to stomp out uh, feelings that are often characterized as as negative. Uh, Let let the sorrow have its way for a season um, and know that you're not sinning to do so. Not only do we see his sorrow, but we also see his submission. The the beauty. um, if, If I can... Uh, once again, dare to paraphrase, to reword what Jesus is saying in sort of contemporary language. Uh, Father, I, I am not excited about what I know to be your will, not in this moment. In fact, I would, I would wish for another way. But if there is no other way, and in this case, there certainly wasn't. If there is no other way, I will be obedient. It's a very clear framing of the, the relative importance of my will and my um, desires and my preferences and my my way I wish the way I wish things were as over against an understanding of what God has willed for me submission doesn't matter as a value until I need to act in a way that's counter to my preferences. If I'm getting my way anyway, it doesn't matter that I'm submitted to the will of a holy God. But when my preferences or my common sense or my way of thinking or, or my desires would lead me to one outcome and my understanding of what God has said in his word would lead me to another outcome, that is where the rubber hits the road in the matter of submission where I must say, you know what, this is, this is not the way I wish it was, but I understand what God has said in his word, 
and God's word is to be my, my regulating authority, not my will, but yours be done. And then we see the sympathy of the Savior. It's interesting because he goes into the garden on three occasions here to pray. And he comes back, and the first time he finds his, his inner ring of disciples, Peter, James, and John, who were nearby him in the garden. He had gone on a bit further in, but they were nearby, and they can't stay awake. And while he, uh, while he chides them a bit in verse, for the first time in verse 40, uh, could you not watch with me one hour? And he encourages them to watch and pray and uh, acknowledges that their spirit is willing, but their flesh is weak. The second time, in verse 43, he comes and finds them sleeping, for their eyes were heavy, and evidently he doesn't even awaken them. In the, in the grand scope of what he is about to face and the brokenheartedness and the sorrow that he is bearing, this would have been a good opportunity for him to kind of kick him hard in the ribs and say, you think that your tiredness is what matters here. I'm about to go to the cross. Wake up, you rascals, and show some love, show some loyalty. In other words, he was in worse circumstances than they were, and it kind of would give him some perceived moral standing to take it out on them, but he didn't. Though his difficulty was the greatest difficulty any human being had ever anticipated facing, the direct and in his case unearned wrath of the Father poured out on him in substitutionary payment, which is now just what, 12 or so hours away, and these guys can't stay awake, and rather than scolding them, rather than blasting them, rather than really chewing them out, Jesus compassionately lets them sleep as long as he possibly can. It's a small moment, but it's a big, big idea that my difficulty does not give me warrant to be abusive to those around me whom I love. Well, it's the garden prayer, and it's a different prayer than the great high priestly prayer we'll be looking at in an ongoing way in John 17. But I wanted to take these moments and have a look at it on this episode of Beyond the Notes. I, I hope by now that you have, you have liked our podcast or subscribed to it, shared it, whatever's appropriate on the platform where you catch this podcast. And we look forward to being with you again on the next episode of Beyond the Notes. Beyond the Notes.